Facebook pays their software engineers around $270,000 per year. In this video, I'm going to show you how to solve their most popular coding problem. Instead of just saying what to do, I'm going to explain the fundamentals behind the data structures we are using. That way, you will not only know how to solve the problem, you can also explain the rationale behind your solution. Before we get into how to solve the problem, I should probably tell you what the problem is. We will be solving problem 146 on leak code, which is called LRU cache. This problem is a medium difficulty, and in order to solve the problem, we need to implement a get and put function that run in constant time complexity. If you're anything like me, you might be wondering what an LRU cache is. A cache provides a way to store temporary data. The reason you would want to make use of a cache is to speed up the performance of your application. Then we have LRU, which stands for least recently used. This tells us what the eviction policy is for our cache. The reason we need an eviction policy is because memory is a finite resource. In order to avoid using too much memory, our cache will have a maximum capacity. Once that capacity is reached, if we wanted to add a new item, we would first need to remove the least recently used one. The thought process behind using an LRU cache is that we want to keep a reference of the most commonly used items. Items that are referenced less frequently don't need to be kept in the cache because the cost to performance would be negligible. With all of that in mind, how do we go about implementing a least recently used cache? One of the strengths of an LRU cache is its ability to know when something was last used. One way to achieve this is by using a doubly linked list. The reason you would use this data structure is when you want to traverse a list in either direction. This can be useful in a number of applications and an LRU cache is one of them. This data structure is similar to a linked list in that the current node stores a reference to the next node. In addition to that, a doubly linked list will keep a reference of the previous item. For the sake of simplicity, we will implement a basic doubly linked list tailored to this problem. I'm also a fan of Kotlin, so that is the language I'm going to use to solve it. If you don't know Kotlin, that's fine. Many of the ideas covered will still be applicable to you. Let me know what language you'll be using in the comments below. We will start out by creating a new node class containing four properties. The first property will be named key and is an int with a default value of negative one. The same will be done for the value property. Then we need to define two node properties, which will be named previous and next. Now that we have our node implemented, we can create our doubly linked list. This class will have two nodes named first and last. When the class is initialized, we will set first's next property to the last node, and then last node's previous property will be set to the first node. All other nodes that are added or removed will be added in between. We do this to ensure we always have a reference to the first and last node in our data structure. It does come at the cost of having two unused nodes, but given the reduced complexity, it's worth the trade-off. A doubly linked list is not useful if you cannot add new nodes, so we will take care of that next. It is important that we have control over the insertion order, and that is why our add function will handle setting the previous and next properties. When we add a new node, we want it to be added at the start of our doubly linked list. We set the node's previous property to the first node because that first node is simply a placeholder. We want our true first node to point backwards to that placeholder. Then for the next property, we set it to our first node's next property. This effectively drops our new node in between the first and second node in the list. If any of this is confusing, I'll leave a link of the full solution in the description of this video. I strongly recommend playing around with that code to get a better idea of what is happening. To round out our add function, we need to update the references on our first node and the next node it currently references. On the first node's next property, we need to update its previous property with our newly added node. We don't have to update this node's next property because it already references the correct node. At this point, we can finally update our first node's next property to the newly added node. We we also need a way to remove the nodes. Thankfully for myself and you, this is a bit more straightforward. When removing a node, we need to update references on that node's previous and next properties. So this function starts by retrieving those and creating local variables named previous and next. Then we set the next property on previous to be the next node. We do the opposite for the next node where we set its previous property on the previous node. At this point, nothing should be referencing our removed node and so it would be eligible for garbage collection. 
or at least it will be in Kotlin, I can't vouch for less sophisticated languages. The last function we need for this doubly linked list is named pop last. The purpose of this function is to retrieve the last node from our list and then remove it. You'll see how we make use of this function a little later on in the video. For now, the important thing to know is we will return our last node's previous property after we remove it. We now have a data structure to keep track of which items were used most recently. However, we still need a way to access them quickly. In order to retrieve an item in our doubly linked list, we would need to traverse the list until we find it. The larger the list of items, the longer it would take to retrieve it, which would defeat the purpose of using a cache. What we are looking for is another data structure which allows for retrieval in constant time. A hash table would be perfect for this use case. Thankfully, for the purposes of this video, Kotlin already has an implementation of this data structure built in and it's called a hash map. I'll be using both hash table and hash map interchangeably throughout the rest of this video. The data structure works by accepting a key value pair where the key is used to look up the value. Behind the scenes, a hash table will typically use an array of linked lists where the index is derived from the key. A hash table will use a hashing function to convert the key into an integer and then perform modular division using the array's capacity. For example, if our array's capacity is 20 and our hash function returns an integer of 63, we would store the value at the third index. Of course, there are more than 20 numbers that exist in the world, which means that two hash codes may end up being stored at the same index. That's where the linked list comes into play. We do not store the value directly in the array. Instead, each index will have a linked list where each node contains a key, value, and hash code. Our first entry at a given index will be the first node of our linked list, and when collisions occur, a new node will be added to that linked list. This is an oversimplified explanation of how a hash table works. If at least 100 people leave a comment asking for a dedicated hash table video, I'll go ahead and make one. Be sure to click the notification bell so you know when I create that video. Now that we have covered the doubly linked list and hash table, we can talk about how to use them for an LRU cache. This cache will contain four private properties. The first is called lookup, which is our hash map that uses an int for the key and node for the value. The second property is our doubly linked list and the third and fourth being integers named size and capacity. To simplify our get and put functions, we'll start by creating a private function for moving a node to the front of our list. The implementation for our move to front function is quite simple. The only parameter it takes is the node we want to move. Then on our doubly linked list, we will call its remove function to remove the node from the list. After the node has been removed, we will call the add function to insert it to the front of the list. Next up, we can implement our get function, which takes an integer as the parameter and returns an integer. First, we'll check our hash map to see if that key exists. If it doesn't, we will return negative one to short circuit the function call. Assuming we're still in the function, the next thing to do is invoke move to front because this node exists and is now the most recently used item. After that, we'll return the value from our node completing the function call. Our put function requires a bit more work, but it's not that bad. This function has two parameters. The first is key and the second is value. Similar to our get function, we'll first retrieve the node by its key using the hash table. When the node is null, we know that it's entirely new, so we go ahead and create a new node using the key and value. Once the node is created, we add it to the doubly linked list and increment our size property. Because this node is brand new, there is a chance our cache has too many items, so we will check to see if the size is greater than the capacity. If it is greater than the capacity, we will remove the last node from our lookup table and doubly linked list, along with decrementing the size. If, however, the node already existed, we'll simply update the value of the node and move it to the front of the list. Then we can click the submit button on leak code and wait for our submission to be judged. This is likely the way you would solve this problem in an interview setting. However, it's not the only way. In fact, we can solve the problem with just a linked hash map in Kotlin. Much of our core logic will stay the same, except we would reverse the order in which items are removed. Instead of removing from the end of the list, we would remove from the front. If you were asked this question at Facebook, there is a good chance this simpler solution would not suffice. If you're interested in a job at Facebook, then I would recommend checking out this video I made about the salary and benefits of Facebook right now. Also, we have a Discord community that is completely free to join, link in the description.